Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Code Red. Thank you for coming this week. Ann Merchant couldn't be here because she is emceeing a Nobel Prize Summit for the National Academy of Sciences, but she says hello. Today, you just get me. Uh, I am Rick Lovert. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange. The exchange is a program of the National Academy of Sciences um, that connects people in Hollywood, storytellers, filmmakers, people who are making mass media projects, to people in the STEM community uh, when they have questions. We hopefully have answers. We've done over 3,400 consults, including hopefully so many of your favorite programs in which grown people wear tights and pretend they can fly. Uh, also documentaries, graphic novels, and video games. So uh, if you are a STEM professional, and this is the first you've heard of us, please do get in contact with us. Sachi's gonna put some contact information down in the chat here. Um, we would love to hear from you. We're always looking for new volunteers. If you are a storyteller and you have a question about science as you're making a piece of media, please be in touch. We're always here to help. Um, I wanna thank our sponsors today, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, without whose support uh, we would not be able to do these events. Uh, also uh, the National Academy of, of Medicine uh, and major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and so many individual donors like many of you. We hope you're, you'll consider us for your end of year giving. It's that time of year. Uh, and we are always uh, happy to um, put your donations into more of this programming. So if you enjoy the programming, please consider us. Um, I want to thank Courtney, Sachi, Jeff, and Ameche for all the background work that you do, the tech, the producing, everything. It's been an amazing year of programming, and thank you so much, you guys, uh, during this crazy pandemic, uh, helping us put this stuff on the air. Uh, today, you are going to hear uh, from Tina Shaw, uh, who will speak and then be interviewed by Milena Govich. Uh, and if at any time you have a question as they are speaking, you can put it down here or up here, depending on what device you're watching this on, uh, in the little bubble that says Q&A. And I'm gonna be behind the scenes uh, feeding questions to Milena. We're gonna get to as many questions as we possibly can. If we don't get to your questions, I'm sorry. It's my fault, not Milena's. Um, so uh, lastly, uh, you know, just to frame this event a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, one thing. Uh, each week we give a rabbit hole. This is a thing that as I was uh, researching this event, I just couldn't stop listening to or paying attention to in my research. Uh, an episode of the podcast, The Ezra Klein Show, is a really great one uh, called The Case Against Loving Your Job that I think draws on a lot of the, the themes of today's event. So if you're interested in going a little deeper on, um, you know, in another format, it's a, a great place to be. Um, so the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine is a private nonprofit institution whose mission is to provide the best possible fact-based advice for our culture, people and policymakers. Um, NAS is comprised of many organizations, one of which it's not, you know, it's not just the National Academy of Sciences that was chartered by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, we also have the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Medicine. And today this event is uh, inspired by the work of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, they have many initiatives in climate change and human health, culture and health, uh, the, Action uh, the Action Collaborative on the Opioid uh, Epidemic, just to name a few. Um, but this one in particular, uh, we really wanted to do an event on and we're excited to uh, have it uh, to be collaborating with the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, I'm gonna hand over the, the mic, the virtual mic, to my colleague, An Tran, who's gonna frame up a little bit of the work of the uh, NAM in this area. So An. Great, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, my name is An Tran. I'm an Associate Program Officer with the National Academy of Medicine. Um, and my team and I have the um, opportunity and, and real pleasure to work with Dr. Tina Shaw through our Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing and Resilience. Uh, we have over 80 members, um, and she's been one of them since the whole initiative launched back in 2017. Um, and I want to share that the goals of the Clinician Wellbeing Collaborative is to advance evidence-based multidisciplinary solutions uh, with the belief that to care for our patients, we really need to take care of our caregivers. Um, and so over the past several years, uh, the Clinician Wellbeing Collaborative has made great strides in raising critical issues like burnout, anxiety, depression, stress, suicide among our healthcare workers. Um, and we've also you know, improved the baseline understanding of the different challenges 
which are really complex to uh, promoting well-being. Um, and especially during the pandemic, uh, the collaborative has continued to make sure that our frontline workers know um, the different kind of resources that are already out there. Um, and we've really made a special focus to work closely with our uh, healthcare leaders, with our government leaders to um, figure out how to really make a difference for our clinicians. Um, and so before I turn it over to Tina, um, lastly, I just wanna share that uh, you know, our team has really seen how this pandemic has changed um, our members, uh, many of whom who still uh, see patients as part of their day jobs. And so uh, even though this group has been working on this issue for several years, we, you know, we just recognize that there's a different energy behind these conversations. Um, and a lot of them are now starting to happen um, outside of the healthcare community. And so we're really excited to host this event um, and really uh, have Tina share her experiences and you know, talk to Milena because um, you know, we really feel that these spaces are really important uh, where we're able to uh, connect to a lot of different people outside of our usual bubbles. So I'd like to turn it over to Tina and thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us. Thank you, Ann, and I just want to, um, again, just say thank you for this opportunity to the Science and, Entertain um, and Entertainment Exchange, as well as NAM, for what I hope will be a pretty engaging conversation on a topic that um, I will argue by the end of our time really is directly connected to each one of us that's dialed in today. So my name is Tina Shaw, and I am an actively practicing pulmonary and critical care doc, and uh, my story from burnout really starts much, much earlier on. In fact, when I was in training, I didn't quite know what it was, but it turns out I was feeling detached and disconnected. And I wasn't sure why I was going to work, but not really feeling the joy that I had felt before. And it turns out later that this, this feeling that I was having was actually having burnout, which was due to all of the workplace factors in that particular um, place where I was working. So I, I want to start um, not really at the at the very beginning, but I want to start by telling you a little bit about what it's been like during COVID to kind of set the stage and then tell you a little bit about burnout, other words we may be hearing like moral distress and resiliency and how all these things are connected and why we need this the entertainment industry scientists anyone that, that is really dialing in and listening, why we need you to try and help us because this is not a healthcare problem. This is actually a problem for the whole United States. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So let's start back to early 2020. And um, I, I am actually enclosing this picture because one day I walked into um, our, our doctor's room and someone had brought cookies, which was great. But at the same time, I was like, wow, this is illustrative of the time period we're in, even the cookies are wearing masks. So um, I would say during COVID um, practicing, it really was beyond what I think any of us had ever experienced. And I want to share with you one day when I was in the ICU pretty early on in the pandemic. And during this time, um, I remember being scared. I remember thinking, you know, have I memorized all the protocols? Because now we have to figure out a way to put on our personal protective equipment, but in a very fast way, because maybe somebody is critically ill in the ICU and we need to be able to protect ourselves and then run into the room fast. And so this is me actually at the beginning of my day, um, this particular day in the, um, in the early part of the pandemic. And here's what happened after that. So I got a report from my colleague who was on overnight about who the patients were, who was the most sick, and I started kind of coming up with my game plan. And as I was doing that, I noticed that some one of the patients was having a lot of alarms ringing. And these alarms basically tell you that something's going on with their heart. And lo and behold, the patient's heart rate was starting to drop. And we all rushed into the room. And this was a patient that I didn't know because this patient had been admitted overnight. And so we rushed into the room. There was me, there was a nurse practitioner and the nurse. And we were trying to sort out who, who this patient was and, and what brought him into the ICU and why, why is his heart rate dropping? 
And to kind of sum up the story, what we learned is that he had been critically ill for some time. And actually he was really having trouble with not only his heart, but with his kidneys and with his lungs. And in that five to 10 minute period, he actually expired and he passed. And here's the thing, we, we didn't even get a chance to, to support him the, the way we wanted to, to talk to the family members the way we wanted to, because you know what, it was the morning and there were two other critically ill patients and we still had to see the rest of the patients in the morning to try and do our best to keep everyone healthy and in recovery and moving on. So life during COVID as a physician or even as a nurse is very, very, has been very, very different. In fact, it's the most extreme experience I've ever had as a physician where you don't even get time to process what's happening. You've never even seen some of the things that, that we now experience frequently. And to give some background in the ICU, up to a third of patients may die. And this is even beyond that, what we experience. And the worst part is not being able to allow family members to really be there for their loved ones whether it's from the early part of COVID when we just did not have the safety measures in place to be able to allow families and, and um, close ones to come in or to where we are now, where it's still so tenuous and so stressful because of how COVID is pervasively throughout, um, throughout the US that we have all these added barriers. And then finally, not only is this the experience of working in healthcare now, we still have to go to the electronic medical record and click around through the, the EMR and try and figure out where is the critical information we need. And we also need to document everything that's happened that day. And in fact, there's a study that shows that for every one hour a physician spends on direct medical care, we actually spend two hours on the computer with all of this administrative work. So think about this framing as we start our discussion on COVID, uh, on, on burnout, and not only what we were dealing with before COVID, but what's happened um, since we've been, been in this pandemic and the continued experience that we have. So I wanna frame up burnout because we colloquially use it a lot, but in this context, burnout is, has a very specific definition and it really is all about the workplace. Burnout is when you have a mismatch between job demands and job resources. And it's actually about the feelings you have about your work. And so I'm framing this to say, when we talk about burnout for healthcare professionals, for clinicians, we have a very specific diagnosis, which is having one of the following, emotional exhaustion, having um, depersonalization. And this is when you start to see people as objects or tasks or start to have more cynicism at work. And the third one is having a low sense of accomplishment. So this is when you may go to work every day and you're at clinic and you're just, you leave the day thinking, did I do anything meaningful and did I help anyone? So I make these distinctions because right now burnout is one pervasive, right? We all, no matter what industry we're in, talk about how stressful it is right now. And while burnout is, is something that everyone feels for the purpose of our conversation, this is really the definition we're using, and I'd love to show you the impacts of burnout when you think about it in this context. So burnout, as I mentioned, is really about the healthcare workplace. And I think it's important because sometimes we also talk about depression, and it's pretty complicated. So let me, let me help break it down a little bit. Burnout, again, is feelings, of, uh, feelings that are triggered by your workplace environment and really is limited to that context. In contrast, depression or other mental health conditions have, have a medical diagnosis that requires individual treatment. So for example, with depression, you may do um, therapy, you may or may not do medications, other types of counseling. So the treatments for mental health conditions like depression are really targeted towards the individual because it is a context independent condition focused on the individual. Whereas with burnout, since burnout is about the workplace, the treatments are actually not so much about the individual and primarily about how we change the factors of the workplace and the system in which the healthcare worker works. Um, I know many folks have probably read articles also about moral distress. And I find this, this phrase so interesting. And 
um, I think it's important to call out because it's, it's emerging as a important piece of the puzzle when we think about the state of which um, many healthcare workers find themselves in and how we can go from being burnt out and morally distressed to being in a state of well-being. So moral distress is a little bit different in that it occurs when we have a mismatch between what we know we should do and what we actually can do. And so this may be knowing that we need to treat a patient um, that is not doing well um, with, with dignity to the best of our ability. And that may be taking away their pain, trying to alleviate their suffering, but unfortunately not having the tools to be able to do that. So that's an example of moral distress. And I think there are many folks uh, that have been on the front lines that have really dealt with this in the, in the last you know, decades, but even more so during COVID. On the research side, um, what we don't know quite yet is how to fully define this um, for more, this term moral distress. And then, you know, how, how does moral distress relate to our own health if we get morally distressed? Or how does it relate to the patients we care about? So this is an area of emerging research. It's closely connected to burnout, but still we're, we're still trying to tease out exactly what impact moral distress has. And then just kind of to lay out the, the, the trend of where we want to go. We, we aim to go from taking um, folks that are in distress and in burnout and really moving us towards well-being and a culture of well-being. And so I call this out to say, while not exactly two sides of the same coin, what we do know is that uh, we have extensive research on what drives burnout, the consequences of burnout, and even interventions to try to alleviate burnout. So we have quite a bit of research and we know there are things that we can do that work. And we're starting to bridge that gap between knowing exactly what is needed to have professional well-being. And so we're still in process and through a lot of the work um, of organizations like the National Academy of Medicine, we've really been able to, to pick apart this ubiquitous syndrome that most face when we work in healthcare and what we can do about it. Because it's not actually just about the impacts that happen to us that work in healthcare, but also to the people we care for. And so let me just level with you. I think this is probably the thing that shocked me the most as I embarked on understanding what burnout is and what it does. Burnout literally causes changes in our brain matter. And so I've highlighted four different things here four different places in the brain where burnout causes changes. The key point here is that all of these changes make it much harder for us to function at the top of our game. It makes it so that a nurse is now going to really struggle with all of the distractions to hone in and pick up that key cue when he goes in to see the patient and is at the bedside. It's gonna make it hard for that physical therapist to notice that this patient maybe is not quite ready to do the therapy and maybe we'll be at a greater risk of falling. It makes it harder for that doctor to, to notice that the patient had a subtle change and it's sort of a, a, um, a sign that there is, is more to come and to, to make a change in the treatment plan. So burnout is not just a thing that, we, that everyone's talking about. It literally is causing physiologic changes in our brains and the consequences are severe. In fact, burnout has now been associated with increased medical errors, with patient mortality in the ICU, um, with increased turnover across all different medical disciplines or many medical disciplines, decreased productivity. We've also seen folks start cutting down their hours, which is a big problem during this pandemic. And I find this fascinating too. There's um, some evidence which um, is emerging, showing the link between when one is burnt out and the, the connection to equity, to health equity. In fact, there was a study that showed, and it was a study done in physicians and training or residents. And what this showed was when physicians were burnt out, they tended to express greater explicit and implicit biases towards patients. And going along this story, when we address the burnout and the burnout reduces, we start to also see that the expression of explicit and implicit biases is also reduced towards patients. So this is not just a minor issue. This is actually a major issue and the largest threat we have to keeping us healthy and keeping us safe, not only during the pandemic, 
but also beyond. And it's been a problem that we've been struggling with for, for decades, both in the US and really around the globe, when we think about how our health system functions. I hope this point's coming across, but in case it isn't, burnout is a systems problem and it really requires systems level approaches to address. And what I love to do is, uh, love to do is ask um, some of our staff to go ahead and post one of our links here. Um, in case you're curious and want to learn more, the National Academy of Medicine has many, many great resources, one of which we're posting now, um, which actually starts to break down some of what we've talked about already, but really starting to think about how do we shift from understanding burnout to addressing the drivers to getting us towards well-being, and how does this really pertain to those of us that um, are, have, have a ability to, um, to share, to spread information, to depict um, the challenges we face in healthcare, to really get, get this so that the public can really understand. So I think as Ann mentioned that the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on Wellbeing launched in 2017. And at first the goal was really to raise an awareness and to try and build the research around what can we do to address burnout because it has such um, severe consequences. And we're now at that phase where we're actually shifting towards tactical action because you know what, the time is now. Um, and alongside that, just to share a little bit more, there are many others working on this too, both outside the federal government and inside the federal government. And in particular, you may notice in the coming months that the Office of the Surgeon General, our Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy, is also very interested in the subject and um, is, is um, putting the steps together for us to really start galvanizing all of us in our communities, because this is not a me issue, this is a we issue. So if I haven't convinced you yet, let me go ahead and, and make, um, make a convincing argument here about why burnout pertains to every single one of us that's listening in today. So, you know, I think it's, it's probably pretty fair to say that if I told you there's a fire going on, that you would find this critically important that we do something about it. And not in five months or not in five years, but today, this moment, within the next few minutes. And here's the thing. Burnout is a disaster. Burnout is requiring our attention just as much as the sparse fire. In fact, our frontline workers, those nurses, those doctors, those community health workers, those folks that help keep the lights on, our custodial staff, our food service workers, all of these folks that work in places where we deliver healthcare are really critically in distress. And so this isn't just a thing that we should address at some point or a, a thing that uh, we recognize as a problem but shouldn't be a priority. This is a disaster and we really must do something now. And I think for folks that are listening in, it's a critical opportunity for us to tell the stories and make the case as to why every single person in our country should think about burnout for our clinicians and figure out what they can do because there's a lot they can do and we need to do it together now. So what can we do to help folks? How can we help folks? And I think I'd like to say there's two big buckets. One bucket is what we can do as individuals now. And I'm actually gonna ask staff if you have a moment to please put in our second link of information it's not just taking care of ourselves, which is important. It's doing a little bit more than that. So I'm gonna give you two things that we can do right now as individuals that would make a huge difference, not only to our folks that are on the front line, but to the health of our nation. Here's number one, get vaccinated. And if you find you have a friend or family member who's not vaccinated, actually have that conversation to try and understand where they are and see if you can help give them the resources for them to make an informed decision to get vaccinated. And I would love to point you to the Surgeon General's uh, website where there's a great resource. It's called the Misinformation Toolkit that really helps facilitate how we can have these conversations in our communities to get vaccinated. And remember the direct connect because right now we've been on the front lines for close to two years with no break, with less people and resources than we've ever had before. And we're experiencing a crunch where we're taking care of 
folks with COVID and other folks that have healthcare issues. And we can prevent quite a bit of this. The vaccine, vaccines really work. And it would be easier for us if we can actually take care of those that really need us and avoid some of these times where people would get sick. So it's really critical that you take care of yourself and you get vaccinated. And the second thing is practice psychological first aid. And this may be a new term to most folks. Here's where we have the power as individuals to help those in our communities, those in our circles that are on the front lines for healthcare. Psychological first aid is a concept to which we can check in on, on our uh, loved ones or on our friends or on our neighbors that are on the front lines. And it basically is summed up as this. It's learning how to see the distress signals of someone that's, that is possibly burnt out, might have PTSD, might be depressed because they're, they're operating in this disaster. And once you spot it, learning how to have that conversation to help them and one, to just support them and then two, to help them figure out what resources they need. Because you know what? We just don't know when we're burnt out and we desperately need your help. In fact, all of our lives depend on it. And then on the macro level, when we think about what can we do for those of us that are in the entertainment industry that have our, have our um, expertise in film and television, I think it's telling these stories and helping us to make the case as to why burnout is not just a me problem, but it's a we problem. It's not just a problem for the nurse that I know that works in the hospital, but it's a problem for me, it's a problem for my brother, and it's a problem for my mother. And how do we make that case? And I think it's by telling these stories of how when, when a person like me is on the front lines and taking care of a 39-year-old male who's really close to my age, who I can see has had a shared experience in life as me, but he's unvaccinated and he's on that precipice of needing to be put on a ventilator, the moral distress that we have compounded by regulations and not being able to move as efficiently as we want and not having the resources, helping us to tell this story so that we as a public can work together and address the chronic system barriers that have plagued us for some time and then urgently help us so that we can just take care of everyone in our communities. And with that, I'll actually ask uh, Mulena to come online. I really appreciate your time and allowing me to talk and give you my snapshot of what burnout is. And I, I look forward to our conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm Milena. Tina, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have 400 questions just based off of all of the stuff you told us. Um, it's really fascinating. And, and as you were uh, saying there towards the end, um, I've, I've been a, a fan and a participant in the Science Entertainment Exchange for a long time. Thank you guys for having me as, as the, the moderator today. I think this is one of the conversations that is most applicable to storytellers because we're really focused on this human experience that these incredibly um, heroic people are having right now. Um, but before we dive into that personal part, I have a question sort of to follow up about um, the psychological changes uh, or the physiological changes in the brain that you mentioned. I find this fascinating. Um, and we had uh, actually some questions in the chat from Pat about this as well. Uh, actually, it was, it was Kay. Um, is are these changes that you're talking about are they specific to burnout or are these all relevant to post traumatic stress or other high stress conditions is is this or is this really more focused towards the burnout this is a direct result of burnout um and a, as a researcher i hesitate to really talk about um conditions i don't quite know you know for, for example ptsd and its potential link to biological changes in the brain but we have extensive evidence now that shows the link between burnout, which again is caused by the place in which you work and how we design our workflows and the technology we use um, and the culture of how we work together in teams. That is directly linked to the diagnosis of burnout, which is linked to these brain changes. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I know that the education process 
for for doctors and nurses and all kinds, physical therapists, radiologists, all kinds of medical um, healthcare workers. That education is very intense. Um, and there were many problems with the healthcare system prior to COVID. In your experience and in your research, where along that trajectory does do you most often see burnout start to present itself? Melina, it's at birth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. In all seriousness, what's so surprising is how early burnout starts. So if we were to put some parameters on training and not talk about high school, let's say, and talk about the first time one goes into some sort of clinical training, and I'm going to speak about medical students because there's quite a bit of research on this, but medical students are some of the most resilient people as they enter medical school. That means they have the ability to withstand quite a bit of hardship. But even during medical school, the rates of burnout are exponential. So this isn't about something that happens at the end of your career. And I suspect there are quite a bit of parallels with the other health professions. It happens really early. It can happen at any time. And in fact, pre-pandemic, it was we have estimates showing about one in two physicians being burnt out. And even for nursing, up to 62% of nurses were burnt out pre-pandemic. So this is, you know, this wow. is another another epidemic, is it not? Yeah, I mean, it it appears to be a systemic problem that's only been exacerbated by the current conditions. Um, I I know, and I'm sure everyone on this um, on this Zoom has had times of high stress in the workplace, and it can often lead to maybe not treating your coworkers as um, graciously or as respectful as you may intend. Is, do you see that happening with these care facilities, especially when um, burnout sets in? You mentioned um, in the opening remarks, the depersonalization element. Are there any things, anything being done within healthcare facilities to address this issue of communication among Peer, from peer to peer or between management leadership? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what I hate about burnout is that it is really contagious. So if mm. you look at research, we, we have this both in the, in the clinic setting, but even in the hospital setting, one person that's burnt out in that care team, in that pod that's taking care of you know, um, a, a, another person, this one person can then impact every single other person and that's the problem. I hate that it's this contagious. But what's so great is that we actually know a lot about what we can do. And so I, I again point us back to the National Academy of Medicine. They have a great website that's called um, the Clinician Knowledge, Clinician Wellbeing Knowledge Hub. And it actually even has case studies of hospitals and clinics and doctors and nurses and others um, that have taken this on. And so, you know, there's one piece that I think. Um, is so free that we should do it. And that's actually recognizing hard work and acknowledging hard work. And that can happen from any teammate to another teammate or from any leader to, to the team that they're working with. And we need to do that more. And I think that's another connection when we think about what can we do um, for, as, as just a public, you know, as, as a citizen or as, a, as American, what can we do? It's, it's that recognition. There's a lot also on how do we strengthen that bond between frontline healthcare worker and their leader, their supervisor. In fact, there's a direct, a dose dependent response of how good your leader is and your risk of burning out. And if your leader has, um, has high level managerial skills, your risk of burnout is less. So there's that. Um, there also are peer support groups. Um, and there's uh, quite a few studies that show, and I think I wanna call out Christiana Care here, and they're in Delaware. They're really um, one of many, many exemplary institutions that have implemented a peer support group because they did a survey and they found out that when people are in distress, they don't call you know, the, the hotline to try and get to a counselor, they call their friends. And mm -hmm. so you get a little bit of coaching and psychological first aid, um, mm -hmm. you learn a little bit more, you become a peer coach and then you can support your colleague. That's wonderful. Um, that that leads me to one of my next questions. Um, I've been very lucky to direct uh, quite a few episodes of Chicago Med, and uh, I really um, respect that show because the writers and the producers and we directors 
uh, take a lot of care in researching and making the storylines as authentic as possible. It's still TV. We all know that. But, but there is a valiant effort that is highly prioritized. Um, I, I directed one of the first episodes of that show coming back from the lockdown. And um, one thing that the writers created was um, Oliver Platt plays a psychiatrist on the show and they implemented a system of the doctors and nurses having regular psychological check-ins with him uh, to monitor their well-being. And it was very interesting. Some of the characters got a lot out of that. Some of the characters completely balked at it and said, I don't have time for this. There are people to save. Um, so that's that's one one way to sort of tell these stories. Do you know of other um, programs or have programs like that been implemented in the real world and and uh, how effective are they? Wow, I feel like you pulled at a tension that we struggle with. Um, what you described was a treatment that's like part targeted towards the individual, but if you deploy it to everyone, is it not a system level intervention? Right. And this is actually something that is being done, but you're right. It, it's not, it doesn't always give you the desired results. And that's because everyone's different. If I were to, um, to say, I think it can be very helpful if the person, the participant wants to participate. I think that's the key. Right. But let me just offer two things that are related, um, but just things I wanna say, I'm just gonna say them. One, we know that over half a million healthcare workers don't even have health insurance. And they're at the front lines and they're particularly in those professions that um, where they're, they may not be highly paid, but they're mission critical, like certified yeah. nursing assistants that are in nursing homes. So if we look at a macro scale, I think we need to ensure that there is access to mental health, not only by it's affordable, but also by we have time to, to get it. And that goes to your point. I'll, t I'll be honest with you. I've definitely worked in places where there's been a meditation room. There's even been massage chairs, like when you, um, when you go get your nails done, but I have never had time to go. Um, so I, I think you're right about that. But the second thing is that this really brings home the point of we need system level interventions. The mm -hmm. fact that we have an electronic medical record that was designed primarily for billing functions we design for, you know, we get what we design for. And if we're using this to try and take care of the person in front of us, but it was designed for billing, what do you think we're gonna struggle with? Um, so I think we really need to think about yeah. making technology work for us and even mm -hmm. changing reimbursement so that we're, in, we're allowed to do the things that we know we need to do for our patients. That's great. Do you know of um, tech companies uh, that are striving to do this right now? Are they making headway? If they are making headway, how difficult is it to get these new systems implemented into our system? Wow. So now I'm like, should I look through, you know, my stock portfolio and name? Some <laughs> yeah, I, we're getting hot I, tips I, here. The Science and Entertainment <laughs> Exchange. So, but, I, but it, it is it is a, always a struggle for new technologies to be implemented into such a broad and belabored system, right? It 100% is. I, I think there's two pieces to it. One, I don't think everyone understands what technology is. It's not just the medical record or let's say the technology that allows us to see what the vital signs are, you know, that the heart rate and seeing it on the monitor. It's also, mm -hmm. it's also the day-to-day -day communication tools we use. I mean, I use email a lot. I know you do. In the mm -hmm. hospital, we, we sometimes use, not sometimes, we often use email to communicate about patient care. We're having meetings to learn the latest science on COVID. We're using Microsoft Teams. So our, our platform of technology is not just the usual suspects um, and, and even the startup community, it's communication software and it's mm -hmm. clinical software. And I think while it's hard to break in because we wanna protect patient information, we, don't, we have no room for error when we deploy these technologies. I think also here's a silver lining. There's so much investment and so much innovation happening in that startup world. And what I would say is some of the most successful startups are the ones that they develop um, technology that then connects into the electronic medical record. It's all about mm -hmm. integrating into the workflows we have because we don't even have time to step out to do the training, right? right. So this right. is, so I think some of the most successful startups have been those that actually take things off our plate as clinicians. 
And that requires designing it hand in hand with a nurse, with a physical therapist. Yes. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I wonder if there are other sort of self-care practices that you have found um, among people you've studied that have worked. Like you mentioned meditation, I'm sure exercise is something, um, maybe journaling, art, music. Can you speak to that? Yeah, actually, I, I think the answer is all of the above, but just like you can't cuss, you have to customize uh, the solutions to get us towards well-being, depending on who, who is your audience, what type of clinician, where they work, it's the same thing. And so I would just, I want to, I want to give you this, and I'm a pulmonologist, so I always think about asthma and emphysema and things like that. And when we take care of patients with asthma, what we do is we actually develop this one page that's an asthma action plan. And it's like, if you have symptoms and you're in the red zone, go to the ER. If you're in the yellow zone, use this inhaler and here's what you should do to monitor how you're feeling. And if you're in the green zone with your symptoms, you're good to go. And that's where I think we need to move. We all need to develop our well-being action plan. Um, also, this isn't for just folks that are working in healthcare, but part of that is what can you do to make sure one, your basic needs are set. You have food, you're sleeping, you um, have, uh, you know, you have some stress management, right? You have some basic things. Um, maybe you, you know, you're dealing with taking care of an elder, or taking care of children, and like, and that's part of the well-being plan too, addressing all your stressors. And then there are some tried and uh, there are some very good evidence-based um, trainings that one can do to build up resiliency. Um, yoga and meditation are crucial um, and important. Um, but I, I really want to hone in on this in that because burnout is a systems issue, we of course should have a well-being plan and we of course should do all that we can to support ourselves. And I want to throw in, we should access mental health too. In fact, I, I go for therapy touch-ups because that's how <laughs> life is and, and then we should all be doing that. Um, but it can only be done if we're addressing the context. I mean, if we do self-care, it's insufficient to address burnout. Yeah. Um, we have so many amazing questions in the chat. I, I want to, several of them um, from, uh, from Pat, from uh, Garth are um, around convincing our leaders or our and or our institutions to institute this level of change. What is it going to take? Is it going to take legislation? What sort of broad top level efforts do you think are going to be required to make this progress? Oh, you're so right, Melena. Uh, also, I heard there's an opening in the in the federal government for folks like you that might want to work on this too with folks like us. <laughs> but, um, you never know. <laughs> We've been dealing with these chronic system issues, right, for decades. So it actually requires all of the above. So I, I, I'm going to start with the health system level because there's so much we can do without changing regulation or legislation. And to me, I think sometimes making a business case is probably the strongest way we can convince people. Plus, I think showing the data on how cognitive load and burnout literally changes the brain, which is crazy. But the business case is this, um, on a macro level, and this is pre-pandemic, burnout caused our health system $4.6 billion. I mean, it, if you're not gonna solve for that, then what the heck else is, is more important than that? We, we all have a role to play. And at the health system level, there are online tools like the American Medical Association has this tool where if you can write in the rate of physician turnover and burnout, you can actually calculate how much money you're losing. And on average, it's about 500,000 per physician loss to burnout. So you can quickly make this business case. But you're also right, on the legislative side, I think there's quite a bit. And again, it's designing our healthcare system so that we're empowered to do the work that we were trained to do. And right now, the way we get reimbursed doesn't incentivize us to spend that extra time to find out that you know mom actually might have some emerging dementia, but we only had 15 minutes with her, so we couldn't find it. Or find out the fact that someone might have food insecurity, but again, we only had 15 minutes. So this is about changing the way we get paid so that it's about value and outcomes and not just doing something more and more and more. 
and also making sure that any regulations we have don't burden the very people that are in shortage. Right now, nurses spend an inordinate, inordinate number of hours documenting, and it's not about anything that directly helps the patient. It may be mm -hmm. helpful for billing, for population health management, but we have technology, right? Can we not deploy technology to automate a lot of this? Can we not change our regulations so that the burden, the heavy load of burden is alleviated? And this is where we need to call on the public because if it's not a problem that every single person in our country understands and feels like is an issue, it's gonna take us much longer to address this. Yeah, um, we've got some other great, great questions here. Um, several about sort of the personalities of people who, who may or may not be more inclined to burnout. Um, Eric makes a suggestion that healthcare has a culture of the badge of honor of working so hard, overdrive. Um, you know, Brian has, has a, a question about you know, the role of meaning in what you do. And if you are a person that really cares deeply about what you're doing and you're getting a lot of meaning out of your work, is, is that sort of a, um, an indicator you're more likely for burnout? Um, is, is uh, there, there was another one here. Oh, and Caroline, Carolina talks about how there may be certain personality traits that are more inclined. And if, if you tend to have one of those, what do you do about that? That's kind of four questions all, at, all <laughs> wrapped up. Well, well, clearly the audience that's tuned in right now is insanely smart because these are the very questions that we ask, um, you know, when we're, thinking, when we're thinking about putting our hats on as researchers or, at, or as leaders um, or as, you know, well-being champions no matter where we sit. Um, and I want to go back to, of course, there, there are some aspects about me, Tina, as an individual that may predispose me to this. But again, burnout is actually a condition that's directly due to the workplace. So um, if I happen to be depressed, let's say I had a death in the family and, and you know, naturally that's pretty traumatic and I have depression, even clinically diagnosed depression, of course that imp impacts my workplace environment. But most of what needs to be done is actually about the system. I find it really interesting that um, you mentioned someone had brought up and I'm forgetting who, who called this out, but culture. This is where we need to focus. And you can almost address this at every level from the public to the individual, to the, you know, to our regulators, to our insurance companies. I mean, everyone has a hand in this. One, the way we get trained, um, we do self-select and we, we're recognizing now we have this problem of perfectionism. I mean, especially it, there's a little more data on this in the, in the medical school environment, but I just can't see how this doesn't pertain to other health professions. But this aspect and this narrative of being superhuman and being a perfectionist, it makes us go and go and go rather than recognizing that we're burnt out and we actually need to get resources and get help. So that's one piece. How can we change a culture so that I'm actually incented and, and encouraged by my boss to take rest um, and actually have, have uh, this sense of teamwork? I think culture is really huge. And I know that the, you know, that Dr. Murphy, the Surgeon General, and even all of the leaders that are working on this in the National Academy of Medicine recognize this critical aspect of culture. Some of it is how we train ourselves, and some of it is what we incentivize. I mean, imagine if, and I'm, I'm totally stealing a page from, from another leader, but let me just say this. Imagine if you got promoted for being a good teammate rather than publishing more papers or bringing in more revenue. What would the culture look like then? And that's mm -hmm. actually where we have to move. And not, you know, in 10 years or 20 years, which is our normal pace, but in the next year. Mm -hmm. I, that dovetails into a question that Clara just asked about um, the stigma associated with counseling or looking for emotional help. It, it sounds like that, that should be part of it as well. It's so true. So, um, you know, the number of doctors that either, and nurses and others, I, I keep saying doctors because I'm biased, obviously, being a physician, but... <laughs> The number of us that maybe even have that thought of getting therapy but don't is astronomically high. In fact, there are some real concerns. Right now, right now, this moment, there are many, there are several states, and we get licensed at the state level, that have questions asking about have we ever had mental health issues? And that's not relevant to your ability to be clinically competent. So if I have depression and I'm under treatment and my doctor says I can function, then I can function, right? But because we have this still in the way we get licensed, in the way we go through credentialing at the hospital level or the clinic level, 
we literally have penalties and we can't access it. So this is, these are two wow. places where we can, we can flip the script. And then I think the other thing is, it's a cultural thing. And I would love to see portrayed someone who's so strong, who's known as, you know, the nurse, the doctor seeking healthcare on TV. I mean, I think this one is, is really big. And um, I would love to see that because even, even me as a burnout researcher, I hesitate myself. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I also want to highlight that what piggybacking on what you're saying about um, maybe some of the lower level or lower paid positions that are in the healthcare industry and those people feeling like there are uh, not only the time constraints or maybe the cultural uh, resistance to getting help, but the financial too. Maybe they are struggling to make their hourly rate um, or being required to clock out because administration doesn't want them taking overtime in certain ways. Um, can you speak to those things as, uh, uh, we, we have a, a question about, um, uh, I apologize to the asker, but oh yeah, uh, Na Nalia or Nyla about the burnout and is it different for women and underrepresented people? Wow, um, I'm so glad this question was asked because 100% yes. Um, the most vulnerable groups, women, folks that are younger, um, and particularly there is, a, there's some, it seems like there's a breakdown. This might be how we researched it, but less than 55 versus older than 55. And I suspect there's probably some component of the increased pressures of documentation and also that these are our childbearing years. So indiscriminate of whether you're, you know, um, the mother or the father, but female, younger, and minoritized communities. And I think we can't belabor this last, last point, the minoritized communities. The number, uh, the, the influence of macro and microaggressions in our healthcare system, we just, we don't even have a handle on it. We know it's pervasive. And so can you imagine, one, being a person that is trying to help others as a healthcare worker, and then dealing with, you know, dealing with structural racism, and then can you imagine a system just like other systems in the US, other industries that, um, that is set up for us to, to have the outcomes of inequities, 100% yes. And what I love is that there are many organizations that have married, how do we get to a well-being culture and how do we address health inequities? It's, they're so closely linked. Um, you can't do one without the other. Uh, Mary has a great question about uh, what's being done related to nursing shortages. Um, the burnout has increased people leaving. Um, you're getting, the people that are replacing them are new, young, unex inexperienced maybe. Uh, what's happening to address that issue? So I love that this got brought up because um, there are so many priorities within what we need to do for healthcare, but I, I dare say, is this not the top one through five? The fact that we don't have enough nurses and how critical nursing is to every single aspect of taking care of, um, of another person. Um, you know, this again, it requires everyone, it's all hands on deck. So what I do know is we, we've had, there are organizations again, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Nurses Association, the American Association of Critical Care Nursing. There are many organizations trying to tackle this issue and it it's requires a multi-pronged approach. So. Um, I think the challenges are going to be the fact that right now we're also having this price gouging issue with travel nurses. So not only have we gotten nurses so burnt out that they've literally left. In fact, there was a survey from um, the American Association of Nurse Leaders that shows compared to last year, there's a 116% increase in nursing leaders intent to leave. I mean, oh this my gosh. is ridiculous, right? I mean, if, if the urgency isn't there, I hope 116% really brings it home. So one is let's address, let's address the drivers of burnout because for the nurses we have, we have to unlock their time. They are elite athletes and we need them. We desperately need them, that's one. And then number two, let's figure out ways to stabilize the workforce by in the short term, by addressing some of the, the travel nursing price gouging, the fact that there may be regulatory barriers to being able to take a nurse who's ready, willing, and able sitting in New York and getting him or her out to California with the next flare-up. So there are things that we can do that um, I think are within short-term control, but this is about having the public demand 
Um, and maybe that's too strong, but I, I really feel that way. It's having the public unlock us so that we can make these critical changes for those of us that have you know, a hand on that. Um, one other question, uh, Brian asked to please comment on the overuse of the term burnout when the sources are better described as moral injury to healthcare workers. Can we just talk about that distinction a little more? Yeah, so this is really tough because let's add some more terms in there, you know, there's <laughs> right. injury, like lack of resilience, uh, then where does well-being fit? I mean, this is also one of our problems, right? I wish there was just one thing we could say, like, could we just say quality or could we just say safety? But um, this isn't like you're pregnant or you're not, right? It's sort of yeah. like this nebulous area and, um, and a bit of a nebulous term. I would, I would highly encourage us to, when we use these terms, to, to actually try and define it. And what's really great is that we have institutions like the National Academy of Medicine and, and a whole trove of research going back to the 70s that clearly defines burnout for healthcare professionals and this as an occupational condition. And we have a, I think, baked enough definition of well-being so that we can see what we're aspiring towards. Moral, moral injury and moral distress, I think, are very important terms. I think the challenge with using them is that they, there is no unified definition like some of these others. So let's acknowledge that every time I see someone where I know I could have done better, but I didn't have enough time or you know, I didn't have the supplies I needed to take care of that patient, of course, I have moral injury and distress, but we don't quite know what that means, right? So I, I mm -hmm. really encourage us to, to stick to some of the concepts that are pretty well defined. Great. Um, as a last little wrap up, um, more back to the personal connection. What can any of us do if we have um, healthcare professionals in our life and we suspect they are suffering from burnout and these issues related to burnout? What can we do in relation to those people? Yeah, this is a good one. Um, this is Tina talking, but I, I bet you if I had some time, I would find a paper that would evidence this. We just don't know when we're burnt out. It's like when you're sleep deprived and then someone calls you out on it and you didn't realize you thought you were functioning with those four hours, you know, for weeks, but but you're not. So I think some of this is learning, learning what the signs and symptoms are. And I'll give you a few, but this goes back to psychological first aid or you know, psychological first aid training. Um, and again, we uh, we dropped, I think, a, a couple of resources um, to, to hopefully help you with that. But I can point you to a, a few L.A. County Pub Department of Public Health has a great um, almost 12 page document. The World Health Organization has another. Um, and uh, one of our federal organizations, SAMHSA, has a great two pa one pager that tells you this. But when, when you're seeing healthcare workers, they're more irritable, they're more withdrawn they sort of seem like they maybe don't have everything together, like something's off, you know, like they're running behind their bills, maybe, you know, they're running late on paying bills. That's, that's like the first sign that there might be something going on. And then it's educating yourself on how to ask those questions in a way where you don't make things worse because the worst is blaming the victim, right? So this is a way where you can't force someone to talk about this, but you can create an environment in which they feel safe enough to open up to you and then you can figure out together what to do. So I think that's great it, advice. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tina. This has been fascinating. Um, I think you and I could keep talking for hours <laughs> about all of this, but we really appreciate your perspective. I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else has here as well. And I, I can see how all of these things are applicable to both my personal work and also my professional work, um, right, telling stories with characters. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure, thank you. Thanks. Hi, Rick. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Thanks you both, that was amazing. We had something like 85 questions, I think, in the end. So we got to as many as we could. Melana, Tina, you guys did an amazing job of getting through a ton. Uh, sorry, we didn't get to everybody, we never- Yeah, there were amazing questions. I saw some of them pop up, I, yeah. Again, when we do the four hour version of this, we can <laughs> tackle them all. <laughs> With an intermission, that's a- Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better way to close out a year of programming for the Science Entertainment Exchange. I wanna, as again, thank our, our speakers, our moderator. I wanna thank all of our colleagues at National Academy of Medicine, uh, our team at NAS and Meche and Sachi and Courtney and Jeff. Thank you for a year 
of most almost every week doing these events. And, um, you know, I, it was a, a brilliant year. I can't wait for next year. Um, we hope you will consider us in your end of your giving. Thank you. We do have a link uh, if you uh, should you decide to support us. And um, I'm really excited about what we have in store for 2022. So please stay tuned to your inboxes. And you know, uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next year.